Hello everybody, welcome to the Tinnitus Masterclass 2021. Now, last year we had this class um, in person and for obvious reasons in 2021 we are having it virtually. Having said that, I'm sure we all can still make the most of this virtual opportunity. Little bit about myself. My name is Dr. Raj Shekhawat. I am a professor in audiology based at Flinders University in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences. I also have uh, an honorary appointment at uh, Ear Institute UCL. I'm the public relations manager for TRI Tinnitus Research Initiative. Uh, and my current research uh, in tinnitus is funded by Royal National Institute for Deaf People. I will share a little bit about my background now with you all. Um, I, for after finishing my master's in audiology, I, I worked for a um, series of countries. I worked in United States, um, Singapore, New Zealand, um, England, and of course now Australia. Now, while I was working for a hospital in Singapore, that was a time I started seeing a lot of clients with tinnitus. And to be very honest, it was very challenging. I wasn't really sure as a clinical audiologist of what else I could offer them. So it was that struggle which actually sparked my interest into tinnitus research. And then of course I did my PhD from University of Auckland and since then I'm in academia and I am working in the field of tinnitus research and trying to come up with novel ways to manage this condition. Now, in today's um, masterclass, my topic of presentation is going to be non-invasive brain stimulation for tinnitus management and research updates uh, about this particular topic. Now, as you all know, tinnitus is a very, very, very common condition. If you look uh, about the prevalence in United Kingdom, there are six million people who suffer from some form of tinnitus. And similarly, these numbers are quite alarming globally as well. And it is projected that by 2050, these numbers are likely to be double. If you look at uh, almost the socioeconomic burden of tinnitus on the healthcare system, um, in England itself, it costs around 750 million pounds every year in GP consults for people with tinnitus. And the same thing is true worldwide as well. And hence, there is a real need to come up with mainstream ways to manage this condition and invest a lot more um, into research as well. Now what we'll do is we will look at some basic facts about tinnitus. For example, as you know, it's a very common condition. Majority of the people will experience tinnitus at least once in their lifetime. It could be after, say, a wonderful night uh, in, in a club or a concert or um, some sort of an accident or stress. And for most of these people, tinnitus disappears on its own and it's not really a problem. However, for some people, it lingers on. And once it starts interfering in their day-to-day -day life, I mean, that's when it becomes a serious problem. I mean, it could result into constant state of anxiety and attention towards, uh, towards tinnitus, which sort of starts interfering in their day-to-day -day life, whether it's sleep, paying attention, being able to listen to things properly, and several other factors. Another important thing is not everybody with tinnitus requires a treatment. As I said, for most of the people, it disappears on its own and it's not really a problem. But for those people where it's a chronic condition and it affects their day-to-day -day life, that's when something needs to be done about this condition. We all know that tinnitus doesn't have a cure yet. And there's a strong reason for that. And one of that reason is that it is a very heterogeneous condition. No two people have exactly same tinnitus. Um, their, their response to tinnitus is very different, their perception of its loudness, its annoyance is very different and hence it's really tricky to find one size fit all solution for this condition. Now um, one of the common things which people with tinnitus encounter is when they try and reach out for some sort of a professional help. Globally the most common response they get is well there's nothing much we can do about your condition. You'll probably have to learn to live with it. Unfortunately, that's not true. 
There are so many options available and it's a matter of us educating ourselves as healthcare professionals and making those options available to clients who are suffering uh, from this debilitating condition. One fact about tinnitus is there was a time a few decades back when people used to think that tinnitus is something to do with the ear and that means it's a ear problem. But not really. Um, in the last few decades, uh, the research has shown that tinnitus perception and its maintenance um, is actually um, coordinated by various um, subcortical areas in the brain. So it's not only to do with your ear, it also to do with a brain as well. There's a constant involvement of various cortical subcortical areas of the brain in the perception of tinnitus. And uh, um, I think tinnitus itself is not really a disease, it's basically a symptom. I mean, it could be associated with so many things. Something as simple as having um, uh, impacted wax in somebody's ear canal that could potentially result into tinnitus to something as extreme as having traumatic brain injury or autotoxicity or some, some other medical conditions. Uh, so once the ear wax is removed, it's very likely that the person's tinnitus disappears on itself as well. It is also associated with um, hearing loss. Most of the time, uh, people with tinnitus will always have some form of hearing loss associated with it. Head or neck trauma, temporomandibular joint issues, sinus or bar tra barometric trauma. So it's always important to have a medical consult so that all of these factors could be ruled out. And if there's an underlying factor which is clearly responsible, once that is addressed, it's very likely that that will have an impact on tinnitus perception as well. Another important thing to understand is a tinnitus intervention or management is beyond the scope of just audiology or, or one discipline for that matter. It requires a very integrated, cohesive, multidisciplinary approach to address tinnitus and its associated um, difficulties which come along with it. Uh, if you look at American Tinnitus Association website, they have broadly classified the existing management options into um, six categories. For example, the first one is general wellness. So it's important to look after the general uh, welfare of the body as well. Um, hearing aids are often talked about as one of the longest standing um, intervention options for people with tinnitus. Um, various forms of sound therapies, behavioral therapies like cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, tinnitus retraining therapy. Um, there are some uh, drugs um, options available and of course there's a big category called um, research tool. So today I'll be talking about brain stimulation, non-invasive brain stimulation and that broadly falls under the category of research tools which are used for um, tinnitus intervention or tinnitus management. Now in terms of uh, neuromodulation uh, it could be classified into two types invasive and non-invasive. Obviously invasive requires some kind of invasive procedure or surgery for example deep brain stimulation or vagal nerve stimulation. However non-invasive brain stimulation include techniques such as um, um, repeated uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation and of course we have direct electrical uh, stimulation such as transcranial direct current stimulation, high definition transcranial direct current stimulation. So I'll be focusing more about TDCS or HDTDCS um, in my presentation so you will be hearing this acronym a lot more times all right so it's TDCS transcranial direct current stimulation. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, the fundamental uh, principle on the basis of why TDS, TDCS has been used for a lot of neurological conditions. So for example there was a study done in stroke management which showed that there was a group of people who just underwent the physical therapy of the paralytic arm and the experimental group underwent one session of brain stimulation followed by the exact same physical therapy of the paralytic arm and the results showed that the experimental group had a, a significant improvement in the functioning of their paralytic arm. So it was more like a priming training protocol for use to sort of prime the brain so that it responds to the intervention which will follow um, afterwards. 
In terms of TDCS as a technique, it's a very simple technique. We use uh, two big rubber electrodes, place them on the target area of the head, where one is anode, another is cathode, where the correct flow current flows between anode to cathode, and it's connected to this little device which delivers mild electric current to the person's head. Now there's a slight variation in this technique as well, where instead of using big rubber electrodes, if we use micro electrodes, which are really small, almost size of my thumb, and they are placed on the targeted area of the head, specifically, for example, at the auditory cortex or the prefrontal cortex into one by four configuration, where you put a central anode surrounded by small four cathodes, and the main major purpose of that is so that the distribution of electric field and the current stays within that ring rather than spreading almost across the whole head. So that way high definition TDCS is supposed to be more focal technique. One of the advantages of these techniques is that they could be used as a very strong blinding tools, which means um, it makes it really, really hard for the patients or the participants to understand whether they are undergoing a real stimulation or sham stimulation. Because they both of these stimulation, it could be configured in such a way that they will initially evoke some kind of tingling, itching sensation, uh, which lasts for a couple of minutes and then sort of fades off which makes it really hard for the participants to judge whether they are actually undergoing a real stimulation or a sham stimulation. So from research point of view, it's a really good tool. In terms of safety, uh, yes, uh, these techniques are relatively safe techniques. Um, uh, we have tested hundreds of participants and no one has ever encountered any major side effects. So. What, as I said, one of the most common sensation which people with the, who are undergoing a TDCS or high definition TDCS encounter is mild itching or tingling sensation or a sensation of a little bit of a warmness on the scalp um, and that's all. And that doesn't stay forever. It sort of fades off after a couple of minutes time. Usually we don't get any random person and put the brain stimulation on them. Uh, there is a strong inclusion exclusion criteria. For example, if someone had a metal implant in their head or their body, um, it's usually a good idea to exclude them. If somebody is pregnant, if then somebody had a history of say uh, seizures, um, it's a good idea to exclude them um, from, uh, from this particular technique. In terms of the physiological basis of TDCS or high definition TDCS, it is usually mediated during stimulation by depolarization of membrane potential and its after effects are sort of uh, mediated by activation of lambda receptors, reduced GABAergic tones and mediated by certain neuromodulators uh, such as serotonin and uh, acetylcholamine. Having said that, there is a lot more which needs to be investigated specifically about the neurophysiological basis of TDCS and uh, there is research, uh, latest research happening in that direction as we speak. Um, I had a wonderful PhD student who is based at uh, Ear Institute UCL. So this is a shout out to Tori Cook uh, who is in the second year of her PhD and she had done this wonderful scoping review um, uh, last year in 2020, which basically looked at the plethora of research which has happened in the area of TDCS, high definition TDCS, and its impact on tinnitus. And um, on the whole, the two scoping reviews done by um, Tori um, and the previous one which, which I led, has demonstrated that there are over 53 studies done in this area. And on the whole, we do have a strong quantitative evidence which uh, demonstrate that uh, these techniques can result into transient tinnitus suppression which is fabulous however uh, we uh, we still need to explore ways in which we could convert that transient impact into longer lasting impact and also we need more research and uh, focus on the neurophysiological basis of tdcs and high definition high definition tdcs so what exactly happens at the neurophysiological level when a client is undergoing uh, these particular technique so currently i'm funded by royal national institute for deaf people and this is a three-year international discovery research grant and as a part of this research grant we are in the process to explore some of these 
factors which I've just mentioned. So I hope this was useful. Um, um, good luck with the rest of your sessions and the masterclass. And I'm very happy for you all to contact me if you need any further information about TDCS, high definition TDCS, or its interplay with tinnitus modulation. Thank you so much and good luck. Bye.